So um, my name is Sandy Black. Uh, I'm a project engineer at Tufsud National Engineering Laboratory. Um, I've been with I've been with uh, these guys for about one and a half years. Uh, my background is CFD modelling, and I've applied this to a number of applications, including um, single phase, multi phase, combustion, and of course the topic today, uh, erosion. So part of my um, Part of my role at Tufsud National Engineering Laboratory is working on both consultancy projects, mainly for the oil and gas industry, but also a significant emphasis on R&D activities. Um, and I suppose what I enjoy the most is the challenging jobs that land on my desk and how we use CFD uh, to help solve customer problems. So I'm pleased and excited to talk about some of the work we do, and in particular uh, today's topic, um, erosion modelling with CFD and how we assess the measurement error in a flow meter due to uh, erosion. So just um, an overview of the agenda today. Um, I'll start off uh, by giving a brief high-level overview of um, erosion and computational fluid dynamics, CFD. I'll then discuss um, about the fundamentals of uh, erosion. I'll talk about how we actually perform um, erosion modeling in TFD. And finally, once we've understood all these, all these elements, I'll talk about how we would approach it um, to evaluate um, uh, the error in a flow meter due to erosion. So uh, in oil and gas equipment, uh, sand is a major component that contributes towards erosion and is unfortunately an inevitable byproduct from the majority of oil and gas fields. Typically, we have high-velocity sands within piping and metering systems, and these can cause uh, significant erosive damage uh, to internal, internal surfaces of components, pipework, uh, and also protective coatings. And this can be a huge concern for operators globally. And the consequences, with, without proper risk management and understanding of erosion, um, the consequences can be pipe failure, financial losses, and environmental issues. So just um, here I have a few examples um, of uh, erosion and what it can actually do. So here we have an example of a two-inch elbow, as seen on the screen. And this was caused by um, sand flowing from the left-hand side at a high velocity and impinging on the elbow. And this uh, eventually caused a hole to form and a loss of containment. So the flow is going from right to left. We have a high velocity region in the center of the pipe, hits into the elbow and eventually creates a hole. Another example is a severely worn um, choke valve cage, which is shown here. And this would obviously have significant issues in terms of flow assurance, but also the functionality of the valve itself. And of course, uh, we also have um, flow meters can be subject to erosion as well. So here we have an example of a venturi. We have some, the flow is coming um, from the screen, uh, through the screen, essentially. And uh, we have some um, erosion happening on the actual tappings. Uh, another example is Coriolis tubes. Um, and again, this has become significantly eroded, similar to the pipe bend. Um, and has actually punctured uh, a hole through both of the tubes. Uh, and finally, a cone meter, where you can see, again, this has been uh, cut in half, so you can actually see uh, the inside of the uh, pipe plus the cone meter, and you can see that it's, it's, there's a rows of damage, uh, especially at the uh, tappings. So erosion analysis is important. Actually understanding it and having an accurate prediction is crucial to understanding uh, the risks and managing it. Uh, however, unfortunately, um, this is quite complex. Erosion itself is um, due to the cutting or impacting of repeated particles hitting the wall. Um, this uh, is not to be confused with, say, cavitation erosion, which is the collapse of bubbles and surfaces, uh, liquid jet erosion, where high velocity jets impinge on the surface or droplet erosion, um, where we have liquid droplets uh, in a high velocity stream impacting the surfaces. So these are not covered in this presentation, but all of these mechanisms do remove material. With um, 
erosion it depends on a number of parameters. So it depends on the impact parameters and the uh, materials of the particulate, the propent, the sand. Um, so, for example, the particle generally needs to be harder than the material it's impacting upon. However, harder materials do not necessarily reduce erosion, as they may have different properties. They may be brittle, so in actual certain circumstances could be worse than a softer, more malleable material. And what we typically find is actually, whilst today's topic is on uh, modelling, it's a combination of testing and modelling that provides the most insight. So at Tubestud National Engineering Laboratory, we offer a suite of tools in our toolbox to help analyze erosion issues from test scale to field analysis. So the focus of this webinar is on CFD modeling, but you need to be aware of the other services that um, we offer because they're all interlinked. So the first is we have a test facility, and this test facility allows us to test uh, various uh, components at um, accelerated erosion rates um, and actually helps validate our CFD models to give us confidence so we can then apply um, these uh, issues into um, field analysis applications. I've mentioned CFD a few times, so I have um, one slide on what exactly is CFD. So computational fluid dynamics is a powerful modeling tool that's used to predict three-dimensional behavior of liquid gas and particle flows. And typically, it's divided, we can divide this into three stages. So the first stage is to define a geometry. And the geometry is a volume containing the fluid. So the green here shows the internal volume of a gate valve where the fluid will flow. We then um, create a mesh. And this mesh discretizes this into smaller volumes, and it allows us to solve equations for the conservation of mass, momentum, energy into each of these finite volumes. So each cell will have a value of pressure, temperature, velocity, or any other physical property. And the solution to these system of equations are highly nonlinear, linear, so they're solved numerically through a number of iterations until the solution reaches a steady state answer. And finally, we create a nice colorful picture, um, which is a 3D representation of the values that we've just computed. So in this example, and in most CFD examples, we typically use this rainbow color scale. So we have a, a blue value typically represents something which is low, um, and a red value typically re represents something which is high. So in this example, the, through the valve, the flow is going from right to left. So a high velocity re region is present uh, after the valve due to the constriction. Um, and we have low velocities near the wall and in various dead or recirculating zones. So that's how we work out uh, where the fluid goes. How do we do this for, with erosion? So the CFD erosion modeling can report regions of wear on the surface of the components due to particle impact. And so we take a similar approach. So we finish off, we've got our fluid flow solution. What we then do is we then define uh, the size of particles and their flow rate into the model and predict where they go. Predict, do they hit the wall? Do they follow the flow? Uh, what happens to them? And then from that, we can take the parameters that we've um, worked out and we can give us a prediction from, we can give us a predict prediction of the wear on the surface. And what I will highlight and emphasize throughout the rest of this presentation is the majority of the time these are experimentally derived values, which is why we typically um, have a coupled approach where we use testing and um, CFD analysis to get the, the best understanding that we can. So before I go uh, into that, as a very high level overview, I have some fundamentals to go through. So um, if we consider a single particle uh, which impacts the surface, such as the animation, which may or may not work on your screen, um, it hits the surface, it removes a certain amount of material, repeated impacts remove more and more material. So while that's a nice animation and can sort of be understood visually, I think ha having a more rigorous mathematical approach would be appropriate so we can pop that into our C 
CFD modelling. So first, what are the important factors of erosion? So erosion has been extensively studied, um, and uh, the important uh, factors determining the rates of erosion are typically the particle and fluid velocity. So we want to know how fast is the particle travelling. So a faster particle will have more force when it impacts the wall. It could cause more wear. So for example, with uh, a typical steel um, and sand, the wear is probably proportional to the velocity to the power of 2.6. We also need to know what the size of the particle is, um, its shape, its hardness. Um, so this will actually govern where the particle will go. Um, will it impact the wall? Uh, will it detach from the flow? Will it follow the flow? Um, all these are important factors. Obviously, our piping configuration, uh, how many bends do we have? Or um, if we have uh, different components, are they getting in the way? Are they causing an abrupt change in flow direction, causing the particles to leave the flow and then hit the wall? So all these are important considerations. I briefly touched on this before, the materials of construction. So is the material ductile? Is it brittle? And these materials respond in different ways. Um, and so it's important to understand, uh, especially in uh, very complex designs, such as perhaps a choke valve, it might consist of a variety of different, different materials. Um, or uh, we might be thinking about making our um, component out of a new material, such as carbon fiber or some other composite. Uh, and so understanding how that responds to um, a variety of parameters is important. Obviously, the uh, fluid flow properties are important. So is it a high viscosity fluid, a low viscosity fluid? Uh, and also the regime as well. Is it a single phase or is it multi-phase? Uh, these have an impact as to where the particles may or may not go and may or may not hinder erosion. And finally, the quantity of sand. This is an accumulative process. So typically, uh, the more sand you have, um, the higher the rows of wear may be. And when I say maybe, if you have a lot of sand, it could perhaps cause a, a barrier just to complicate matters and help eventually. So let's look at some of these properties in a, in a little bit more detail. So let's consider uh, two cases um, that we have through a gate valve and look at the uh, particle projection. So in the left-hand image, the particles flow uh, around the valve body. And in the right-hand image, uh, they impact the body. And this is essentially governed by the inertia of the particle relative to its fluid media. So if we consider a, a constant particle, constant size particle traveling either in a high density flow, high viscosity fluid, or a low density, uh, low viscosity fluid. So if we have the high, if we have a, the particle carried by a high density, high viscosity fluid, such as a liquid, um, this allows the uh, particle to stay within the flow and follow the streamlines of the flow. And that's shown on the left-hand image. Whereas on the right-hand image, uh, we have a low viscosity, low density fluid. So the particle uh, will now have a high inertia and is likely to detach from the flow. So it will continue along its initial trajectory and impact the wall, therefore, therefore potentially causing uh, a region of a rows of wear, and that's shown on the right-hand right hand image. Now we can do the same image, but we can we can keep the um, actual properties of the fluid the same. So if we consider a fixed density and viscosity of the fluid, but now this time we alter the particle size. So on the left-hand side we have smaller particles, and they have lower inertia, so they will follow the flow. Whilst the larger particles detach from the flow, they have higher inertia, um, and they impact the wall. And the particle size distribution that we're talking about can vary widely from flower to millimeters, for example, in oil and gas applications. So a helpful way to characterize this is through the use of the non-dimensional Stokes number. Uh, and this characterizes the behavior of the particle suspended in a fluid flow. And it's useful in helping understand the situation where our particles will impact the wall. So it's defined as the ratio of the characteristic time of the particle, given by the relaxation time, its fluid velocity against its characteristic length scale. So that could be its uh, diameter. 
typically what we see is when we have a Stokes number less than one, uh, it will typically follow the flow, whereas when we have larger Stokes numbers, it has high inertia and it will typically likely to detach from the flow and impact the wall. And this is actually quite a useful tool when you're thinking about um, your uh, actual design, uh, whether or not erosion may or may not be a problem. So the other thing we need to consider is the actual ductility of the material. So we have um, two images here um, on the angle dependency for a ductile material on the left-hand side and a brittle material on the right-hand side. Uh, and these are classified on their response to an applied stress. The applied stress in this situation being um, a particle uh, battering into it. Um, so brittle material typically on the right-hand side typically has a linear stress-strain relationship up to the point of failure. So it undergoes uh, elastic deformation only, um, whereas a ductile material will typically undergo a large amount of plastic deformation. So you can see that from the, the, the digging um, before, it actually, before it actually fails. So for example, we have uh, ceramic materials um, are typically brittle and metal materials are ductile. So typically when we're looking at, say, a steel, um, we typically find that between about 20 to 50 degrees, um, so this is a ductile material, they will they'll dig and deform, where a brittle material typically experiences higher wear rates at angles close to about 90 degrees due to the fracture. So we can simplify this and represent it by a simple simple graph. So here we have, on the black line, we have the uh, ductile response, and then the, the red dashed line, we have the brittle response. On the x-axis, we have the particle impact angle going from zero to 90 degrees, where 90 degrees is impacting it um, directly onto the surface, um, and, and it, below that is at uh, an angle parallel to it. The F of alpha is our function, our ductility function, um, zero being the best case, one being the worst case. So you can see with ductile material, typically between 20 and 50 degrees is the worst case scenario, where brittle material is um, typically the worst case scenario at 90 degrees. So the nature of erosion, um, unfortunately that's not simple either. It may be evenly distributed all over, it may be localized in erosion hotspots. Typically, once an erosion scar starts, it keeps digging, but it may not keep on digging at the same rate as the impact angle will change as it starts eroding. It can sometimes be very unstable. It can be rapid, and again, it's complex. And as I've reiterated a few times, it's not very well managed or understood. So on the right-hand side, I have a CFD prediction of a Christmas tree configuration. Uh, so this considers a number of uh, blind T's that we have here, bends, uh, choke valve, venturi. And you can see in terms of the, the colors for CFD where red is high spots, we have quite a number of hot spots, either caused by a roping effect as the, as the flow is changing direction or as it's accelerating through a venturi um, as it continues through this through this Christmas tree configuration. So I suppose a, a good question is uh, how much sand do we need? Um, we don't actually need that much sand. If we have quite a high velocity, ga high velocity gas and uh, a little bit of sand, that can cause significant issues. The sand production uh, varies significantly and it's often only a small fraction percentage by weight. So less than 0.01% can cause major erosion problems. So for example, in, in that context, 0.2 kilograms per million standard cubic feet of gas or two kilograms per 1,000 barrels. Uh, so generally sand content in the range between one to 50 parts per million by weight, um, but can cause uh, significant issues even at that. Let's complicate things even, even, even more, why not? Let's uh, consider erosion in multi-phase flows. So if we have this uh, example, this 
a theoretical example where we have a pipe full of gas and let's say it is moving at one meter a second from right to left and we put in a particle and this particle has uh, a velocity of two meters a second but it's coming in at a 45 degree angle towards the bottom of the wall. The green line in this just represents half of the pipe. Um, so the particle will come in, it'll bounce, it'll gradually lose momentum um, and eventually it exits the geometry. If we now consider what happens uh, when the top half is full of gas and the bottom half is full of water, um, what we will have is the particle again comes in at, say, two metres a second at a 45 degree angle. This time it doesn't bounce off the wall. Um, it loses all its inertia. So um, it continues within, it gets trapped within the liquid. So therefore, uh, in multi-phase flows, uh, a liquid film could develop, um, which actually could, in this case, help reduce reduce wear. Um, however, that's it's not always always a situation. It helps sometimes, but it's not always a situation. So we do need to consider the interaction of the sand particles within a multi-phase environment quite carefully. We do have this this uh, example where we have this liquid film. This could develop, and it could cause these high-velocity sand particles that are within the gas to become trapped within a liquid film, lose momentum, possibly alter direction and reduce wear. However, if we have another flow regime, such as slug flow, um, we have periodic regions of high velocities, either at the front of the slug or perhaps at the, uh, within the gas, and these can periodically come in and actually enhance erosion rates compared to a single phase application. So it really do does just depend on the flow regime uh, the particle size, the uh, mass of particles, and um, the fluid velocities. So let's pop this into a nice mathematical formula. So here we can estimate the material loss um, through this equation. And these parameters are shown on the right-hand side. So we have uh, a particle coming in. Uh, so that will have a mass flow rate, MP, that will come in uh, at a velocity uh, up hit the ball and rebound and that will come in at a particular angle and impact our our material so we need to know our material properties kn f of alpha our particle velocity our impact angle and of course the um mass flow rate of the particle which we have here so here typically k and n and um, these are derived from testing and they're based on both the particle and uh, the material properties. The particle impact velocity, typically that's quite difficult to measure. So you may know the uh, fluid velocity and you then may have to use computational fluid dynamics to work out actually what the impact velocity is. We then also want to know our ductility of our material, F of alpha, uh, and of course our mass flow rate of our particles. So how do we actually determine some of these parameters? Well, what we do is um, we detect, measure, and assess the wear under controlled erosive flow conditions. So we typically want to perform a test uh, with sufficient wear uh, versus time. And when we say sufficient wear, we mean something that's measurable. Erosion can take years, uh, and that's obviously uh, quite expensive for some people to run a test for years and quite time consuming. So we will generally accelerate the tests um, either by increasing the flow rate or um, increasing the sand concentration to give us something which is measurable. And we've got quite a lot of experience uh, doing that over, over a number of, number of years. So before, during and after the tests, um, we'll do a variety of things. We'll take some visual inspections, some photos, some dimensional measurements, um, some wall thickness measurements, and also weigh it. And what we typically use is we use coupons. So um, here, for example, we have an example of a steel coupon, which was a cylinder, and the flow is going from right to left. And uh, you can see how much uh, wear has actually happened after 24 hours and then after 144 hours. And this allows us to uh, document exactly what's happened under particular conditions. Now, the next stage is to get um, 
good quality uh, erosion predictions. So we use our CFD model to essentially benchmark um, the test against the tests and derive suitable empirical constants. So let's take our eroded steel coupon. And what we'll do is we'll build our CFD model and model exactly what was happening in the test um, and alter some of those uh, material properties to give us the right amount of wear information. Typically with steel, it's quite well understood. Um, so we generally don't have to do um, much calibration with these ones. If we have a polymer or a composite or a, or a different material, uh, then yes, we'll need to spend a bit of time and actually develop a, develop a model. But once we have this model, we can then apply it to um, field conditions or uh, more, re more realistic applications other than a coupon. So the CFD of uh, modeling of erosion, um, the testing is used to provide definitive erosion performance data. And we use this mathematical model to uh, combine the CFD to give us an accurate model. And it allows for confident predictions in the field analysis. So here I have an example of a, a choke valve cage. Uh, the left-hand side is the CFD model. The red regions show where you expect the erosion to happen. And on the right-hand side is uh, where is the actual choke valve choke uh, cage. And um, you can see that the top half, top half of it has actually eroded. So CFD erosion modeling. So as I've explained, uh, we have our fluid flow solution. We inject our particles, and this can be a different particle size distribution. Some will impact the wall, some will follow the flow, and we get our erosion prediction from experimentally derived values. And this is typically our standard approach. We also have a little bit more of an advanced approach, and this is important for um, flow meters, especially differential pressure flow meters. We have our fluid flow solution, our particle path, and our experimentally ex ex our erosion plot that we've derived from experimental values. What we can then do, one more step, is we can actually change the geometry based on these erosion rates and recalculate this. So this actually allows us um, to provide a 3D uh, detailed map of erosion. And we can take a step further as well, and we can couple it with finite element analysis. And this allows us to look at failure and stress. So just another example, if we have an initial geometry, we've got a pipe uh, with uh, an uneroded wall. In this example, the, the wall is uh, incredibly thick. Um, we then uh, have our erosion prediction. So most of this happens at the bend. The material gets removed. We then recalculate the uh, geometry. And so what that's then doing is uh, changing the geometry, which will change the velocities. It'll then change the impact angles uh, and the particle velocities at the wall, and it'll alter the erosion rate. And then we can perform our finite element analysis if we so desire. And for example, in this case, if the pipe is under pressure, it may fail um, for a particular wall thickness. And we can, we can determine that. The benefits of doing the CFD erosion modeling is that we can, uh, unlike simple tests, we can model complex piping configurations, choke flow paths, uh, various other different flow paths through equipment. And we can also um, specify our operating conditions that we want that may be unachievable through a laboratory test. So we can look at different particle sizes, sand concentrations, fluid flow rates, different fluid data, we can get the impingement wear areas. We can identify potential critical erosion hotspots. We can estimate uh, material loss or wear rates, and eventually predict the wear life of the component or the equipment. And this allows us to do some sensitivity studies, so you can assess it over a range of conditions. So one other point that I did mention before was that you need to be confident in your uh, erosion modeling. So here I have uh, an experimental test. Um, and this was done in two inch pipe work. And it has three bends. This was done a number of years ago. So on the left hand side of this is a picture of the setup. Uh, we have gas and sand coming in, impacting bend one, bend two, and bend three. So we've got some data. 
taken some measurements, we can then set up our CRT model. So we have our inlet, outlet, and our three bends, and that's the flow direction. So we can get our prediction on bend one. So you can see the actual highest erosion rate, the millimeters per test, is around about 1.8 to 2 millimeters um, at that particular um, location, so right in the center of the pipe. So the question I have is, is that realistic? So we can take our measurements from this configuration. So we can see a picture showing the cross section of bend one, showing half the pipe. We have this rippled scar that we can, we can see. If we take the same image from the CFD, we can see that we're actually predicting the same, the same trend. So that looks, that looks promising. We can take it a step further and let's take some measurements along that red line, along the outside of the pipe bend. So this goes from zero to 90 degrees, 90 degree bend. And we can take various different measurements. And we can take the same information from the CFD and compare the two together. And we can look at our standard approach and we can look at our advanced approach. So we have the degrees uh, along the bend between zero and 90 on the x-axis and the millimeters of erosion on the y-axis. So the square dots are the experimental values from some calipers. Uh, you can see the peak is around about 0.8 millimeters. We have our standard approach, which is the white um, circles. And we can see that it does predict the trend well, but we have a, a relatively high peak there compared to the experiment. Whereas when we use the advanced approach, um, because uh, the erosion might start off quite severe to begin with, but as we are eroding away the pipe bend, it alters the fluid velocity, it alters the uh, particle path, it will slightly change it. So we actually have a reduced rate of erosion there too. And we can plot this as it evolves um, throughout the time of the test. So the total time of the test is 285 minutes. And you can see here that the uh, erosion is gradually increasing. And actually what happens is it happens predominantly on bend one, and then it starts to get more severe on bend two. And what's actually really important as well is um, predicting where these particles go and how they rebound. Because if that is not a, not an accurate um, representation of what's actually happening with these particles, you may predict the erosion on the first part quite well, but on later elements of your system, uh, they may you may be actually be predicting the wrong um, the wrong regions, and that's really important when you're starting to change the geometry as well, um, because you could get completely erroneous results further downstream. So what I will say is the values that I used there they were for carbon steel, and I didn't actually tune them for the, exper for the experiment. So I didn't have coupons. These are based on literature values. So sometimes literature values are, are fine, but you do need to validate that and compare that. The standard approach is good, but it's conservative. And I suppose that's what you want when you're trying to do some analysis here. So we had a peak of 1.4 millimeters compared to a peak of 0.8 against the experiment. The advanced approach, however, is more realistic, especially with higher levels of wear. It changes the shape of the geometry, it alters both the fluid and the particle profile, and it's important for erosion on the first surface and also those downstream. So we had a peak of 0.9 against 0.8. Excellent, good. So I think we are at a stage where we now understand um, the majority of components that go into um, that go into uh, how into how we model erosion. So the next stage is how we would approach a flow meter. So let's consider a differential pressure meter. So we have flow going from left to right, which I think is the first time in these slides. Most of the time it's going from right to left. Um, so a differential uh, pressure meter essentially uses the principle of Bernoulli's equation uh, to measure the flow of fluid in a pipe. The flow meter itself, uh, whether that be um, a cone meter or an orifice plate or something else, uh, it introduces a constriction, which creates this pressure drop. When the flow is increased, we get a higher pressure drop, and we have various impulse piping lines which route 
the upstream and downstream pressures to a transmitter that gives us the differential pressure, pressure which is proportional to the flow rate. So we have an equation. So Bernoulli's principle states that the flow rate is essentially proportional to, um, to the pressure drop. So just in a little bit more detail what each of these mean um, and what can be um, important for erosion. So the following equation, it gives us the flow rate being proportional to the expansibility factor for the gas, the throat of the restriction area, the ratio of pipe to throat diameter, the pressure drop, and the fluid density. We also have a discharge coefficient. So in this discharge coefficient, uh, this can be determined uh, experimentally through a calibration, so through a known flow rate, um, and uh, measuring the differential pressure. Um, or we can use a standard, such as ISO 5171, um, for an orifice plate or another differential pressure meter. So um, ultimately, these parameters uh, are fixed, with the exception of obviously the upstream and downstream pressure. However, um, when we introduce uh, sand or some other propent, uh, these pieces of equipment can become damaged. So in this equation, for example, the throat diameter might become larger. So without any knowledge of how erosion affects the meter and changes the overall inner dimensions, uh, we could actually have larger measurement errors. So we could remove the meter and we could recalibrate it and get a new discharge coefficient to reflect these changes. Um, but as soon as it's subjected to more wear, we will be required to do this again, and we don't want to do this all the time. So having an understanding of how erosive conditions in the field uh, is important to assessing uh, what's the right meter to put there in the first place, as well as its position, um, potentially meter calibration intervals, and also the subsequent errors that we have too. So in this example, let's consider a cone meter that we have. So we have two pressure tappings, P1 and P2, and we have our differential pressure. Uh, and we would then take um, a variety of steps to assess its impact on uh, erosion and the flow going from right to left and it accelerates over the cone. So step one, let's say we're going to do this in CFD and we have a brand new, brand new design. So we have our flow rate, our fluid properties and our geometry. So say for example that's water. We then perform our CFD analysis and we get our pressure drop. And from there, we can work out our discharge coefficient. And we would do this for a variety of different flow rates. So that is essentially our calibrated model. We have a discharge coefficient related to that geometry. We then move on to step two. Step two is to start destroying it by putting in um, a variety of sand. So again, we determine what the fluid is. This could be different from the calibration fluid that we used before. So before, we might use water as a simple simulation. In this case, we might use a multi-phase flow, or we might use um, an oil or, or something else. And we have the geometry as well. We then need to determine what we're actually putting in. So what is the propent? What is the particle? Is it sand? Is it something else? Is it a combination of all, all of these? Uh, and what erosion time we want to evaluate to. And what's important is that we take this data from experiments, whether that's been done in the literature or whether that's separate testing. We do the CFD analysis at a particular time t, so we advance it at a smaller time than t end, and we look at the erosive wear at time t, and that gives us our erosive, uh, eroded meter, and there's a geometry change there. Have we finished yet? If we haven't, uh, we will update the time step and keep on doing this repeatedly. And eventually we will have um, our eroded meter or the geometry change at the end of our um, particular uh, operating conditions. And then we move on to step three. And step three is basically just to repeat step one, but this time we've got our deformed uh, meter. We form our CFD analysis, and we work out what our new discharge coefficient is. And we can then assess the differences between um, step one and step three. And that's how we would compare our error. So just final slide just that we have here. So we have our 
this is a plot of velocity. So again, the uh, flow is accelerated at the restriction, which is after the cone. Um, this is our new meter. We don't have any erosion yet. We then put it in after one year, at a particular, particular flow rate, and we can see downstream of this cone meter, the actual pipe is becoming larger. And that actually results in a different um, pressure downstream. So our DP is actually changing. And then after three years, it's even larger, and we have a, an even larger shift. And we can plot that. So we've got our constant flow rate coming in. So that's our actual flow rate uh, in green. And then this uh, changes. So the measured flow rate is based on the um, measured pressure drop that we have from our CFD calculations. And we can work out how much of a shift this is actually, um, is actually uh, impacting, or when we need to possibly recalibrate the meter under certain conditions. So to summarize, um, erosion is a complex wear regime, and small changes can significantly affect wear, le wear levels. The flow testing is essential to understand wear characteristics of components and validate equipment performance. CFD models can provide significant insight, uh, but do not need to be validated with test data to have confidence in, sorry, but do need to be validated to have uh, confidence in modeling field conditions. And the erosion testing and CFD modeling are just part of the toolbox which we offer um, for pipeline integrity, risk, and maintenance management. So we offer this toolbox, we have our test facility, we can provide the CFD model validation and essentially the field analysis. And erosion is just one of the many services that we offer. Um, we do a variety of things in research, testing, calibration, consultancy, and flow. Uh, flow we have a variety of flow measurement facilities, multi-phase wet gas single phase densometers and elevated pressure and temperature. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much for that, Sandy. Um, I think we've got time maybe just for a couple of questions, Sandy. Um, if you could just bear with us uh, for a couple of moments uh, just to we pull up some questions. Um, I don't know if there, is, is there any questions there, Sandy, that you might want to tackle? Possibly. Have a read. Sorry, we're just trying to uh, magnify the screen there. So we have a we have a question about the roughness of uh, surfaces considered in the model. Um, Typically, the roughness of the surface is uh, not considered in the model, but uh, we can do. Most of the time, we don't really know what the roughness of the surface is, but it is something that we could, we could measure. Uh, I imagine it would have uh, a little bit of an impact, but it depends. it depends on the particle size and what you're looking at. So if you have a very, very, if you have a couple of microns, roughness, but your sand particles are one millimeter, then it's likely that it's not going to make a, make a significant, significant difference. Um, there's a few other questions as well. Um, one is just a general one. Uh, what would be the best approach to mitigate erosion in a piping system? Um, so this is essentially, I suppose, a balance between mitigating erosion whilst also, I suppose, ensuring that there's sufficient pressure to drive the flow um, to its desired location. So if we go back to everything, so if we have the, the size and the, the, the shape of piping components in combination with the sand particle size and the fluid properties, such as the density, the viscosity, um, these obviously influence the amount of erosion caused by sand. So you would probably select pipe diameters that are as large as possible. So you'd keep the flow, flow rates low. 
we don't want them too low um, because uh, obviously you may not be able to have may not be able to have sufficient pressure to drive the flow. So, for example, if you have um, if you re each time you double the velocity, I think the erosion potential increases roughly by about six times, and you might typically get 30, 40, 50 meters a second. That's not uncommon. Um, so even small amounts of sand can uh, eat away at the pipe walls. So um, I suppose other things you could do as well is uh, you could try and have um, try not have any blind tees. Uh, perhaps have some uh, 90 degree elbows, which are long radius rather than short radius. Um, I suppose it's also important to consider what type of flow you have. So typically in uh, oil and gas applications, um, as the fluid travels towards uh, the production facility, there's a change in pressure and temperature, and that results in multiple phases, which give you different flow patterns. So along with the accumulation, I suppose the the dropout of any sand or propants that you have, it's important to understand their impact on erosion. So I suppose, if, again, if you reduce your flow rate, it's going to impact on production, um, but it'll also um, have an impact on your flow pattern. So you could go from one flow pattern to another and get completely different areas of erosion. So it's not really an easy question. It really depends on the actual configuration itself. So, I mean, we could do some CFD analysis of very com various components uh, and allow us to do that. Um, one interesting thing that we're, we're doing at the minute is we're, and for multi-phase flows, is we're building, uh, a, well, commissioning a new facility at the minute that's allowing us to go up to about 140 bar. And part of the other uh, things that I'm involved in is looking at these flow pattern maps at different pressures. So having a better understanding of that will actually help us validate some of our models for multi-phase flows, and then we'll start tackling uh, erosion as well on top of that too. Um, there's another question, uh, which is uh, which CFD programs are used. So typically we use ANSYS Fluent. Uh, so some of the stuff that uh, we can do with the deforming erosion has been in there for a few versions now. Um, so we typically use commercial, commercial software packages for that, typically ANSYS.